Hello, my name is Larry Hamilton, and I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. On July 4th, Mike Ullery wrote a guest column in the Pickwood Daily Call titled, Pendulum Swings Too Far Before Return Journey. I became troubled and concerned about some of the comments expressed in the article and eventually decided to contact Mike. For some reason, I considered his title choice peculiar because to me it seemed to resurrect another image and period of transformation as relates to a political and social swing affecting public opinion and my mind recalled the arc of the moral universe speech of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. ending the Selma to Montgomery march on March 25th, 1965. I come to, to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long, because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. Truth, forever on the scaffold, wrong, forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the ark of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. In the 4th of July guest column of photographer Mike Ulrey, he wrote a commentary that made a lot of sense if one were to capture a snapshot moment in a frustrating hour of national racial dialogue following the wake of yet another divisive five or Supreme Court ruling in the case of Ricky versus De Stefano. Personally, I don't disagree with the ruling. Let me restate that. I don't disagree with the ruling. But what I have difficulty accepting is the opinions that were somehow apparently derived from the case and that have resulted in what I consider to be several untenable conclusions as expressed by the writer. Some of, the, some of the thoughts alluded to in his commentary can only be given credibility if one chooses to ignore or deny two centuries of the nation's history of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, and exclusion from the political, social, and economic institutions of this nation based largely upon race and gender. Let me state this in another way. I contend that Mike, like many Americans, are not capable of carrying on an intelligent, principled dialogue on race because in order to do so, it would require a sophisticated understanding and acknowledgement of the historical role of slavery and racism in the United States, which I suppose is why so many presidents, congressmen, corporate tycoons, religious clerics, and academic scholars of the past embrace the policy of ignoring, trivializing, marginalizing, dismissing, or altogether omitting discussions of the racial history of the United States. 
To further illustrate my point, since the writer submitted his offering on the 4th of July, I think that he and many call readers would also be well served by reading or listening to another historic speech. This one delivered by Frederick Douglass and given more than a hundred years earlier than the above cited King speech. Frederick Douglass was invited by the good, fair-minded citizens of Rochester, New York, to speak at the 4th of July celebration of 1852. He accepted the invitation, but his audience was shocked and clueless to the irony of the occasion and the hypocrisy of the moment when Douglas unleashed a scathing attack. He told them, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mock. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. I cite these speeches to offer a discerning public a perspective on historical context when discussions of a racial nature are addressed. Now, let's take a specific look at some of what Mike Ulrey offered up in his column. He wrote, No doubt there was a day when it was necessary to ensure that minorities received fair treatment. Those dark days, which unfortunately lasted generations, are some of the most shameful in our American history. I would really like to know why you think it was necessary and if the fair treatment of minorities has been real or perceived which you referred to earlier in the sentence just before this paragraph. At least you use the correct historical context in referring to the shame of America lasting generations. In the next paragraph, you write, it took men like William McCulloch for whom the square in downtown Piqua was named in his honor just this week to spearhead the civil rights movement. Now, I think I know what you were attempting to say, but you overreached in crediting William McCulloch with spearheading the civil rights movement. Perhaps this was unintentional, but here again it might be offered as circumstantial evidence of trivializing or dismissing the role of blacks in their own leadership struggle for civil rights. Apparently, you are only looking at one side of the historical marker on the public square. 
William McCulloch played a key role in the legislative passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But this is hardly the historical equivalence of spearheading the civil rights movement as relates to a Douglas, a Du Bois, or Martin Luther King Jr., and maybe hundreds of others. Next, you wrote, like so many good things once started, the pendulum swings too far before starting its return journey. I'm not sure what you are saying there, but if you were suggesting that after three centuries of slavery and another of Jim Crow segregation and racism, that America finally and rightfully began to swing the pendulum toward fairness, justice, and inclusion of minorities and women into the mainstream of American society. I'm in agreement with you. But if you are stating otherwise, you would again have to dismiss, trivialize, or omit any historical context to the complex and complicated effort to find full equality within the United States. Mike, in this next reference, I'm not sure if you are just uninformed or you are intent upon misrepresenting the facts. In this paragraph, and again later in your commentary, you refer to the majority of Americans as being white males. Here it is, the majority of Americans, at that time, white males. Please stop making that reference. It is a false statement. According to the 2000 census, white males make up 31.7% of the population. White females make up 33.2% of the population. And, of course, coupled with the other minorities, there is a uh, majority on the part of uh, women and uh, minorities, not white males. White males are not now, never have been, and almost assuredly will never become the majority in the United States. You suffer from the illusion that was created by the Founding Fathers when they gathered and conferred upon themselves a 100% political quota system that allowed for economic, educational, and social set-asides, the remnants of which have lasted until current times. And that is not a perception, but a matter of historical reality. In the next paragraph, you rail against the expansion of equal opportunity to women, blacks, and other minorities. And then mention, if you were a white male, you could forget it. And you close with the wild and improvable assertion that in our quest for equality, our government has made it difficult for a majority of Americans, and you can read that again, white males, to get hired. Wow. Let me restate 
my earlier premise. Mike, like many Americans, are not capable of carrying on an intelligent, principled dialogue on race, because in order to do so, it would require a sophisticated understanding and acknowledgement of the historical role of slavery, racism, and sexism in the United States, which again is why so many people embrace a policy of ignoring, trivializing, marginalizing, dismissing, or altogether omitting historical context into discussions of race and gender discrimination in the United States. Mike, this kind of language is offensive, inflammatory, and simply untrue. Evidently, you are attempting to foster a notion of new racism where white males are the victims. And these allegations are most often made and easily referenced during times of economic downturns when it is easier to project the pain and instability of job loss on others. Mike seems to lament the end of a period of exclusive white male entitlement. Let's think about a hypothetical case. You have a fire department that has existed for, let's say, 200 years. And during that 200 year period, women and minorities were not allowed or discouraged from applying to join that fire department for 170 of those 200 years. But within the last 30 years, about 10% of the force has become female and black. In this hypothetical city, blacks make up 40% of the total population, and women as a demographic are of course a majority. But because a dispute arises over department promotions, it sounds as if he would argue that not only the promotions are earned and merited by white males exclusively, but that even the entry level positions that were previously held by white males entirely should be restored to that past level of entitlement. Mike, the gain of 10% of entry level department positions still means that 90% of those positions are still held by white males. You seem to want to play a zero sum game. If the Fortune 500 corporation were headed by all white males until recently, and women and minorities now head 50 of those corporations, that again tells me that white males are still doing pretty good, but to you, I suppose, they would merit continued leadership in all 500 positions. As I look around, I don't see this desperate impact you allude to with the disproportionate suffering of white males. The last time I checked, minorities suffered unemployment at more than twice the level of their white co-laborers, co and women still are paid less than 80 cents on the dollar for the same type of work performed by men. Given past inequality, how would you level the playing field you write about here? You write, America has become a country where bias and racism have become factors against many whites.
Here again, Mike, you have to ignore or dismiss any historical context to write or think anything like this. Mike, if America is only now becoming a country where whites in particular are subjected to a perceived bias and racism, then you might want to consider the fact that heretofore those victimized by bias and racism were women and blacks. Mike, I don't have a problem in advocating for your First Amendment freedom. Here you say, today much of the bias is while a black man can speak openly about something perceived as negative about a white man, the reverse is not true. If a white man attempts to point out a perceived negative about a black man, he is oftentimes labeled a racist. Well, again, I say, I don't have a problem in advocating for your First Amendment freedom of speech, but please don't think that others or I must accept your thoughts as being the gospel truth. I'm sure you'll agree that the comments of white males and everyone else should be fair and balanced. You say, we live in a land where all men and women are created equal. And that sounds great. But the historical reality is that when that was written and framed in the Declaration of Independence, it was not believed or acted upon. And many who utter this today are still openly paying lip service to the hypocrisy of Jefferson and the Founding Fathers. You further write, there should be no laws to regulate hiring. There should be no need to have quotas for hiring or promotion in any company. Here it sounds as if you are suggesting that an egalitarian nirvana is possible. But I would suggest <clears throat> that this in part is the reason government is instituted and that we entrust to it that which we are unable or unwilling to perform as individuals. The founding father James Madison wrote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. While all of these founding fathers who were white men were great and created lasting democratic ideas and principles, I think there would be few who would argue that they were angelic. And I don't believe man's nature has changed in that sense. Mike, you wrote, I am tired of living in an America where people feel the need to be referred to as African American or European American. Well, I don't know what to tell you. You are either going to be forced to live in a perpetual state of fatigue or you'll have to consider relocating elsewhere. On a personal level, I don't have a need necessarily to refer to myself as an African American, but I feel quite comfortable with that designation. I suppose if there had not been a need on the part of white males in America to strip the name and cultural identity of my ancestors upon arrival 
here in America, then I might be more willing to dispose of an African connection. But here again, only the black man was treated in that manner. Africans were forced to abandon their name, their language, and culture. But Europeans and others could voluntarily choose to sever their national origins and ethnic ties in assimilating in America. Turning back to your column, you wrote, if we truly live in an equal America, then we should all be Americans. Skin color should be recognized as nothing more than what it is, a difference in the color of our skin, an anomaly no different than some of us are short and others are tall. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by your, by your reference to an equal America. I think your reference is based upon an ideological perception, a desired democratic goal or value, a principle such as a colorblind society. But you don't define it or explain it. You just make an assumption that you think is commonly understood and agreed upon. But it's not. And you truly believe that and if you truly believe that, then your statement should have taken on a different level of affirmation. And the hypothetical if could have been dropped entirely, but the reality, reality is that while skin color matters less today than it did a generation ago, by any measure of objectivity, race still matters. In America. So then, if race still matters, and we truly do not yet live in an equal America, is there an activist role to be played by the government that you insist upon as being a race-neutral agent? Here again, you lack the knowledge necessary and the role government has historically played in collusion with racism and white supremacy. Until you understand this historic role and acknowledge it, we will, as a society, be limited in our ability to create an equal America and a colorblind society. Many Americans have passionately argued in recent weeks that apologies ought to be made in the national media fan debate over the Gates incident in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But none of the involved parties offered an apology for their behavior. All asserted that they had done nothing wrong for which they should be forced to apologize. But on June 18th of 2009, an apology on race was made of national importance, and few Americans know of its publication. It was a critical statement admitting past behavior for wrongdoing against black people in the United States. And hardly any people are aware of its existence. 
And yet, I believe that every American that opens his mouth or takes pen to paper and argues a point of racial distinction should first be asked to acknowledge having read the concurrent congressional resolution apologizing for slavery and racism in the United States of America. The reason why so few Americans are unaware of this document is by design, I believe. It was not covered in the Pickwood Daily Call so that staffers like Mike Ullery could have easily been informed of its relevance to his comments in that guest column written just two weeks later on July 4th. It was hardly given noteworthy coverage by more important regional media outlets such as the Dayton paper or TV news outlets. Even the national papers seemed to bury the story or assigned little relevance to it. But in the aftermath of the media blitz and the national passion unleashed over the Gates incident, I would have thought that with hindsight, it should have been cited, but I did not hear it referenced. My personal observation is that this follows my premise and supports my conclusion that many Americans are not capable of carrying on an intelligent, principled dialogue on race, because in order to do so, it would require a sophisticated understanding and acknowledgement of the historical role of slavery, racism, and sexism in the United States. Which is why I believe so many people embrace a policy of ignoring, trivializing, marginalizing, dismissing, were altogether omitting historical context into discussions of race and gender discrimination in the United States. This information was more accessible, of course, on the internet. But let's take a look at what our congressman wrote. June 18, 2009, referred to the Committee on the Judiciary. Concurrent resolution, apologizing for the enslavement and racial segregation of African Americans. Whereas, during the history of the, United, of the nation, the United States has grown into a symbol of democracy and freedom around the world. Whereas, the legacy of African Americans is interwoven with the very fabric of the democracy and freedom of the United States. Whereas, millions of Africans and their descendants were enslaved in the United States and the 13, <coughs> excuse me, and the 13 American colonies from 1619 through 1865. Whereas, Africans forced into slavery were brutalized, humiliated, dehumanized, and subjected to the indignity of being stripped of their names and heritage. Whereas, many enslaved families were torn apart after family members were sold separately. Whereas, the system of slavery and the visceral racism against people of African descent upon which it depended 
became enmeshed in the social fabric of the United States. Whereas slavery was not officially abolished until the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States in 1865, after the end of the Civil War. Whereas, after emancipation from 246 years of slavery, African, Amer African Americans soon saw the fleeting political, social, and economic gains they made during Reconstruction eviscerated by virulent racism, lynchings, disenfranchisement, black codes, and racial segregation laws that imposed a rigid system of officially sanctioned racial segregation in virtually all areas of life. Whereas the system of de jure racial segregation known as Jim Crow, which arose in certain parts of the United States after the Civil War to create separate and unequal societies for whites and African Americans was a direct result of the racism against people of African descent that was engendered by slavery. Whereas, the system of Jim Crow laws officially existed until the 1960s, a century after the official end of slavery in the United States, until Congress took action to end it. But the vestiges of Jim Crow continue to this day. Whereas, African Americans continue to suffer from the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws long after both systems were formally abolished through enormous damage and loss, both tangible and intangible, including the loss of human dignity and liberty. Whereas, the story of the enslavement and de jure segregation of African Americans and the dehumanizing atrocities committed against them should not be purged from or minimized in the telling of the history of the United States. Whereas those African Americans who suffered under slavery and Jim Crow laws and their descendants exemplify the strength of the human character and provide a model of courage, commitment, and perseverance. Whereas, on July 8, 2003, during a trip to Gori Island, Senegal, a former slave port, President George W. Bush acknowledged the continuing legacy of slavery in life in the United States and the need to confront that legacy when he stated that slavery was one of the greatest crimes of history. The racial bigotry fed by slavery did not end with slavery or segregation. And many of the issues that still trouble America have roots in the bitter experience of other times. But however long the journey, our destiny is set. Liberty and justice for all. Whereas, President Bill Clinton also acknowledged the deep-seated problems caused by the continuing legacy of racism against African Americans that began with slavery when he initiated a national dialogue about race. Whereas, 
an apology for centuries of brutal dehumanization and injustices cannot erase the past, but confession of the wrongs committed and a formal apology to African Americans will help bind the wounds of the nation that are rooted in slavery and can speed racial healing and reconciliation and help the people of the United States understand the past and honor the history of all people of the United States. Whereas the legislatures of the Commonwealth of Virginia and the states of Alabama, Florida, Maryland, and North Carolina have taken the lead in adopting resolutions officially expressing appropriate remorse for slavery and other state legislat legislatures are considering similar resolutions. And whereas it is important for the people of the United States who legally recognize slavery through the Constitution and the laws of the United States to make a formal apology for slavery and for its successor, Jim Crow, so they can move forward and seek reconciliation, justice, and harmony for all people of the United States. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate, the House of Representatives concurring, that the sense of the Congress is the following. One, apology for the enslavement and segregation of African Americans. The Congress acknowledges the fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity of slavery and Jim Crow laws. Apologizes to African Americans on behalf of the people of the United States for the wrongs committed against them and their ancestors who suffered under slavery and Jim Crow laws. And expresses its recommitment to the principle that all people are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And finally, in closing, a word from the scriptures, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And I would also like to say that my comments today are exclusively my own. And I would also like to uh, extend that invitation to Mike uh, Ulrey and hopefully we might be able to sit down and uh, perhaps have a civil discussion uh, about uh, where the United States is currently and where we need to go uh, in order to forge a more perfect union in the United States of America. Thank you for allowing me to share this perspective on U.S. history.